I would like to ask our, our panel to come up and uh, sit in the appropriate order, the smartest at one end and the best, the best looking at the other end of the, of the spectrum. Uh, while they're doing that, I want to correct, uh, correct Miguel. Uh, Miguel referenced a school uh, called Georgia, Georgia Tech. And I want you to uh, understand that that really is uh, Emory's engineering annex. That, um, and, and the reason I struck and hit John uh, was because he's actually an alum from, uh, from Emory as well. And, and he was singing Go Bumblebees or something like, <laughs> uh, like that at the time. So I feel kind of bad about that. Uh, certainly a, a couple of our folks mentioned the um, uh, mentioned FCC and Tom Wheeler. I think we're uh, we all have operate that uh, watching that operation is going to be very important to some of the pivots uh, in our market as it has been in the last uh, last few years as well. I had mentioned about the SOBs. I want to let you know that the CIO for the FCC is an SOB uh, as well. So we I'm uh, anxious about uh, some of the initiatives ongoing there. We've t uh, talked a lot about the operating infrastructure facing. I think Tim uh, started us um, off on the, what I would call the lifestyle issue. If we look at the usage patterns, we can talk about what we offer and we often talk about capabilities when people buy solutions. And uh, so one of the challenges is how we address the changing nature of the solutions market against those changes in the, uh, in the uh, carrier services and content providers as well. Uh, so I'd like to open up first by having us think about what, what uh, lifestyle changes, what changes in the market might you expect that will be uh, pull side for, for transition of carrier services and feature sets. Anybody want to? Uh, Lifestyle? Yeah, starting with the lifestyle, demographics, user demographics, millennials and Gen Z patterns of use are very different, as Tim was saying. Sure. Actually, we just had a presidential election when two millennials were competing <laughs> against each other. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and obviously they demonstrated to us uh, that we're better off having millennials run the country than having uh, mature and, and establishment people that know how to play nicely. Uh, but in any case, uh, I think what we've seen among the demographic shifts is not just that people don't watch TV, but people don't use the legacy technologies that had been the, the linchpin, the foundation of, you know, we talked a little bit, why doesn't 911 work? Well, because we're never home and we don't stand still. And you know the fact is we have a fixed network, but we still need a fixed network. You know all this video traffic on uh, on uh, mobile video. If we didn't have Wi-Fi, we'd be in big trouble for the mobile network. Uh, we wouldn't have any any capacity to to run it. So legacy technologies, if we abandon them abruptly, which is what's tending to happen, we don't have the capacity to absorb the usage patterns in the new technologies. Uh, so we, you know, we can talk a lot about cloud. Uh, cloud is huge, everything is in the cloud. Uh, but at the same time, it eventually has to get to us. It eventually has to find us wherever we are. Well, I just want to make a quick, uh, two quick comments. I, um, I think we're going to see a convergence between wireline and wireless networks. I think you're going to see a convergence between Wi-Fi and LTE. And that's one of the major benefits that cable companies can get by buying you know, cellular companies. So they can have the lowest cost per bit. So mobile operation. operators take over on license spectrum? Is that what you mean? Well, well partially. But um, you know, I think you'll also be able to leverage the wireline plant a lot more with small cells, lots and lots of small cells. We're going to have cell sites you know, basically everywhere. But the other point. You brought up the presidential election. I mean, Trump did hardly spend anything on television advertising to win this election, which is just because they gave it. To him. They gave it to him for free, but <laughs> uh, that—that's you know, 
it, it kind of calls into question this whole advertising model, which is a huge, huge industry. It's like a $500 billion industry. Does it make sense as it's currently structured? And I think there's no way it makes any sense in five years. Well, they took all the spectrum away now, right? They're about to s sell it back to the mobile operators. It, it was interesting, uh, some of the comments you mentioned about the cable companies and how they're set up for um, potential success in the future, where, what assets they have today and what assets they're looking to invest in the future. I, I tend to agree. Um, they are uh, well positioned in the home uh, because of the, uh, uh, what they've done in the past. But also the strategic, the strategic flexibility they're doing right now by putting so many Wi-Fi hotspots, that's a bet in the future. That's a five or 10 year bet. That if you put enough hotspots out there, you can then replace those hotspots maybe for 5G. Um, or luckily, I did not mention 5G in my talk, but that's an area that while it's a five or 10 or 15 year bets, these large cable or large infrastructure deployments are. If you look at the business cases, I know the Verge does, I'm sure <coughs> 10 or 15 years business cases. This business case around the wireless hotspot, Wi-Fi hotspots is a 10 or 15 year business case. The, the more they cover the lamp posts, then they can replace those later with IoT devices. Um, uh, leveraging LoRa or, or Sigfox or some of these narrowband IoT capabilities as well. This is what, this is what uh, Holland did. Holland did literally uh, 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 low band, narrowband IoT all over the, the entire country. So the specific regions where the cable companies have, um, have access to today, that's actually a really good play potentially, potentially in the future for them to buy a, a mobile operator at a right price. Because if you roll by, then you, you're stuck with that uh, debt. But it's, uh, it's something to, to watch out for. Because it is a strategic flexibility they have. And there are some nuances going on with the market that we can talk about a bit more on why that's, that, that, that is, why they're doing it today versus why not a few years ago and why not uh, later. So we'll talk about that too. <coughs> Carlos, uh, <coughs> One of the, we, we keep regressing back to talking about from the carrier provisioning push side of the market. And we seem to avoid that, pre, that prediction and changing nature of the pull side that we always act surprised uh, later on. And uh, I, I wonder in one thing, we talked a little bit about the IoT side of the house and you've got the DDoS uh, attack that took place recently that should have been a grand wake-up call, uh, not only for the edge devices, but the elements in the network, too. And we keep pretending we uh, have historically from 20th century operated with centralized or decentralized network architectures in a world that is distributed. And that distributed network structure is going to be governed pri from privacy and security very different mm -hmm. than, the, uh, than many of the past we've had in the, pl in the past. So we are awakened to the importance of semi, uh, some nominal intelligence at the edge. Those sensors are not going to be tolerated to be completely dumb uh, or uh, certainly a, a ability to be made zombies, nor will the network be uh, wait till securities in the traditional transmission lines as well. So how do we address this, uh, uh, Carlos, you, uh, mentioned about the uh, the IOT world growing sure. and how are we going to grow I think reflect on the Mar marathon man uh, <clears throat> movie where uh, um, Olivier's saying is it safe is it, is it safe Carlos actually you you mentioned a lot of subjects here I mean from, uh, from, from IOT for IOT to be implemented at some some something needs to needs to to change. The, the first thing is the elimination of passwords. We need to really, as an industry, start eliminating passwords, being able to use not only the phone, but something that I know, something that I am, something that, that, that I have, meaning I am going to use my mobile, I'm going to use a pin, and maybe I'm going to use bio biometric. That is going to solve some of the adoption of, of, of IoT, and when, when users start adopting that, you will be able to get, I think, something better. In, in the sense of the zombie the devices and stuff like that, that is a very complex conversation. I mean, we have some, some meters that are written in DOS still, and those things need to change. And the only thing that we can do in, in this stage is, is, is going to be what I said at the beginning, 
having those devices behind something secure, like, like a secure element, the, the most secure element that the GSMA knows today for some of these devices is, is, is going to be using connectivity through the SIM. Uh, I'm not going to say the SIM cannot be hacked, but the SIM is, uh, is, is a very secure device when, when, it's, when a SIM is authenticated with the network. Uh, there has been only one case that they, they said the CIA claimed that they, that they were able to, to hack into it. I don't know. You know, I don't work there. <laughs> but uh, that is a, de a, a, a device that we can use to start that authentication, being able to ensure that we have alternate channels to do that. Uh, for the home, uh, today, we are all, and I'm guilty of this, we have uh, a simple router with simple passwords. Um, Comcast and all the companies are giving us better passwords. What's your dog's name? <laughs> <laughs> I don't use that. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but what, what, what I think you're going to see in the, in the, in the future, I'm uh, talking about prediction, is a dual network in which you, you, you're going to have um, a Wi-Fi net network like Miguel and Tim, uh, they, were, they were talking to people to do connectivity, but people are going to start adopting a second router using cellular to be able to authenticate um, and, and secure those, those elements. Nobody wants to know when you're brushing your teeth. And going, and, 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 and going forward, that is going to be happening. Here in the US, that might not be a big deal, but we're having those conversations in countries like Mexico where people are getting kidnapped and, and they are sometimes worried about adopting IoT or operators are thinking, how can I deploy IoT here when my citizens are worried about security and to people to know when they are there, how can things get hacked and so on. Commerce is based on authentication and attestation. Who are you and what rights do you have? I don't care whether you're a person or a sensor or a thing. It's going to be challenged and challenge itself as to who can use my information. How are we going to affect this? And certainly a SIM structure, you're going to need nano SIMs, micro SIMs, mm -hmm. SIMs some mm -hmm. other structure of SIMing that's not quite exactly what we've, ha what we've had in the past. Is that, uh, is that fair, Bearish? You have a well, in fact, a very small percentage of IoT endpoints uh, are SIM-based. And it's unfortunate, you know, actually, one of the characteristics of both MTM and, and uh, IoT are that the devices, the end devices, have you know 10 or 15 year shelf life, and nobody goes near them, and they're supposed to have batteries that last that long. And unfortunately, that means that we have very old technology sitting out there that haven't been secured. So we're going to have to do a very large scale replacement uh, of that install base, uh, and we're going to need to be able to put. Uh, technologies that will last another 10 to 15 years uh, in place. And that's why planning for 5G now is critical. Mm -hmm. Because we're really, you know, MTM is a 2G network environment typically. Most of these sensors are on 2G, uh, uh, if not, uh, you know. So I, I think from the security standpoint, what's amazing to me, Donald Trump told me that it was Chinese hackers who turned the uh, batteries in the Note 7s uh, into zombies. And, you know, uh, as a result, <laughs> everybody has a pocket warmer now. Um, so, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing, if you can imagine that being real and pervasive, how easily you could attack these kind of endpoint devices, right? I mean, is that surprising? It's, uh, yeah, well, it is, uh, <laughs> first of all. It, w but I think that the, inis the, the issue is larger than, than I think we're stating that right now is, uh, so for instance, uh, the mining industry. The mining industry uh, leverages Caterpillar, for instance, for a lot of their mining. And a mine usually is around 80, 90 miles in circumference. So to go have a truck going around those miles, these trucks are by $10 million, $4 million, $20 million each. IoT is actually driving all these trucks, or is soon to be driving all these trucks. For each maintenance and repair for these caliper devices, it's going to cost a fortune if you do it afterwards. If you do, do preventive maintenance, it, it will reduce your cost. So the, the question is, how do we educate the CIOs, the CTOs of the different industries that will be leveraging IoT? Because that, that's where the pocket of IoT's uh, usage will, it will be the most. So if you go to mining, or Caterpillar, if you go to Boeing and or Airbus, the amount of sensors they have in the planes, connecting to the fuel tanks, connecting to the, to the avionics, 
that's the, the education around IoT and security needs to go to those industries that are using the most, because those are the CTOs that need to be aware of it. Um, that, so, and then there's a double-edged sword, big sword. So that's one, one comment around IoT, because that's the, a, a huge growth in IoT is in, 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 in specific use cases, and there's a lot, of, a lot of dollars, a lot of people, and a lot of investments behind it. So even in the mining space, just, just so you know, there is, a, there is an IoT device that looks at eyelids. And the amount of eyelids, if a person goes through eyelids too much or they, they close the eyelids too much, the engine shuts down of these huge trucks. The entire engine shuts down because that person's too drowsy. They're driving a five, <coughs> five million dollar machine with a lot of uh, cargo from the mine. You, you don't want somebody drowsy and falling and, and, and uh, disrupting the, the, the entire mine. We could use that, uh, that technology in the trains in New Jersey. Yeah, uh, okay, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> uh, but, I, I think the biggest issue in our children's lives are going to be uh, privacy. You know, for what it's worth, I think there's going to be a massive abuse of uh, privacy data at some point. It's probably already happening, but you look at like what Microsoft paid for LinkedIn, it's like a hundred times EBITDA, and they're basically buying data. They're trying to create social networks. You look at the value of Facebook, the value of Google, it's all about, you know, the data. And it's, right now, even the FCC was, had a privacy ruling. It was kind of up in the air. We'll see where kind of privacy goes. But I have no doubt that the carriers are going to try to figure out how to monetize that data because really, you were pointing up those customer data and you look at the firm values of Google and Facebook, it's all because they're, they are abusing and are going to massively at some point abuse our privacy and our data. Well, and you, you know, we have former FCC Chairman Wheeler uh, that is Say still... What? Still. Say what? He's still. <laughs> oh, he's still in office? Mm -hmm. oh, Until Trump comes in. I didn't realize that. But uh, he, he's, just not, he's just not showing up, but he's in office. <laughs> my, my point is that um, we are at the end of a regulatory period which has been use, using the wireless industry to fund government, basically. Um, and what I say we're at the end because we've auctioned off all the spectrum that exists. Uh, in bands that are available for, for 4G. And uh, we've got obviously raised a lot of money. Um, we've also picked a lot of pockets. I mean, tell me how many, how many more billions can be invested in Spectrum now that AT&T and Verizon are buying content companies and every other kind software companies. Um, I mean, well, a dish is hoping for another 30 billion. Yeah, right. another one, right, right. another one. <laughs> but I mean, now the 600 megahertz auction that's occurring as we speak, Rather than bidding up, it's being bid down. And it's the, it's the first time where the auction value is going down as opposed to going up. And we're, we're starting to see the end of this cycle of you know, spectrum <clears throat> crazed. Uh, broadcasters announced today that there is no spectrum crisis. It's a myth, um, kind of like global warming. And you know, it's, it's about mobile operators wanting to usurp all the spectrum from other applications and wanting it all to be part of their future <coughs> monopolies. So I dis disagree with your consolidation theme. I think the next thing that may occur is for T-Mobile and Sprint to become Charter and uh, Comcast rather than merging together. I think, you know, trying to preserve the four competitors at least uh, is probably a good thing. Um, and Sprint and T-Mobile don't have wireline assets, don't have home home networks, so they need to be partnered. On the other hand, they've been available all this time. Why they waited until now, maybe it's because we're going to have a Republican administration. Well, the, one, one of the issues, I, I do think Verizon's going to go after that $200 a month triple play bill you have at home and try to s sell it at 100 bucks, And that's a big issue Verizon. for the cable companies. Verizon is, yeah. And that, that's a big, big issue for the cable companies, and I think they're going to do out of, out of defense. And, you know, I would just say, I was just in Israel, and uh, I was there five years ago, and last time I was in Israel, the ARPUs were 40 bucks. This time they were 12 bucks. And the EBITDA margins went from 35% for the wireless companies down to 12%. Um, and the, uh, I met a counterpart at Cellcom last time I was there five years ago. He had one title on his card. He almost ran out of room with the number of titles on his card. He had six titles. And I'm like, what happened? He's like, well, we went from 7,000 employees down to two. I'm like, oh. <laughs> That's, uh, yes. So this industry, 
our prices in the United States for cable services are triple the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Our prices for wireless are double the rest of the world. I mean, uh, on an equal basis. The reason they're going to consolidate is they want to hold the prices as best they can because the cable company is going to be under massive risk. And there's a chance, you know, even the wireless industry. I mean, if they all start going after one another, if the cable companies use Wi-Fi like you're describing, it could be a bloodbath. No, go ahead. I wanted to ask you, where do you see the impact of, of OTTs trying to launch networks into this mix? Of, uh, like, like, like Google, Facebook, that they're trying now to, to, to become also cable providers, you know, and, uh, you, you and mean, broadband providers, too. Well, you know, at the end of the day, it, it's kind of hard for them to, everyone was always worried about Google Fiber. Yeah. I, I just think, you know, it's hard to have much impact. Mm -hmm. The industry is spending, as you know, you know, in the United States, $65 billion a year on CapEx, and right. there's a lot of the legacy infrastructure. It's really, really hard. These guys don't really, really want to get into the infrastructure business. Although the one area they are spending a lot of money on infrastructure is on cloud. And we didn't touch on artificial intelligence, but I think the other issue is going to be, um, Amazon just announced another artificial intelligence, Amazon Web Services, an artificial intelligence product tonight. I think this industry has got to start to figure out how to use a lot of those same technologies. And I, you know, I would just point out the example of customer care. AT&T still has 50,000 call center employees. I should not be calling up that call center employee when I have a problem. They should be using artificial intelligence and figuring out that I'm about to call them. Well, um, and and uh, certainly I want to incorporate things that we like chatbots and others, which are patterns and forms of communication that are, are growing, that when uh, made more intelligent will be a, a, a more considerable part of the pattern of communication. But Tim, you mentioned the issue of the carrier prices at other parts of the world. And that's in part because they're carriers. One of my questions about this mingling of content and carrier, uh, uh, does anybody have any concerns about, uh, about a trend that might grow that mingles facilitators and participants in a market? Well, Comcast already owns NBC and, uh, you know, at and I'm talking about competent coordination. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure where we're headed with that. But in any case, uh, uh, AT&T bought DirecTV, and it was kind of a sleeper acquisition in a way. No, people didn't really understand it. But now the notion that AT&T can offer a video package from DirecTV as an app on a mobile device, and in fact, it's available anywhere, um, they can't necessarily produce the same quality that you would get at home on your mobile device, but they will under 5G or the fixed wireless access uh, networks that are coming. Uh, I think what's really happening is the whole notion of OTTs and carriers is going to break down. And, you know, not that all the over-the-top providers are going to build networks. That probably won't happen. I think you're right, Google Fiber was an experiment, was something to pro prod the industry into doing something. Yeah. But the real disruption is what Facebook is doing. Uh, Facebook launched an initiative called TIP. Um, many of you haven't heard of it. Uh, what its purpose is, is to create an open source environment around network equipment and to give away the intellectual property. And rather than have Cisco and Ericsson and, and the big companies have uh, proprietary technologies and compete on uh, who can provide the best features or the best routers or whatever, in fact, have everything commoditized, not only virtualized, but in a way that it becomes uh, a giveaway, it becomes a technology, very low price technology. So TIP is very disruptive. You wouldn't have expected a company like Facebook to be launching it, uh, but that's the way big OTTs can but Birch, Is that getting traction? Uh, open yeah, source there were over 200 participants in the first uh, TIP meeting that just took place about three weeks ago. And uh, none of the big guys, of course, but a very big movement. And when you have companies like Red Hat that are putting open source almost on everything, OpenStack, uh, I think open source is going to be a huge I uh, force of innovation. Um, and, and it's going to change the way software is really defining our networks. 
Oh, okay. A quick question for Birch I got asked before, because you have a lot more knowledge in this than me. You're implying that 5G is going to work and be cost effective. Do you believe that? So, you know, nobody knows what I mean, 5G... I mean, fixed wireline yeah, replacement. No, I, I understand. So, uh, we're working right now on the first wave of 5G, which is uh, wireless, uh, fixed wireless uh, uh, access. And what it's really about is taking these bands that previously were uh, used for backhaul. And since we have fiber, we don't need deep backhaul, we don't need microwave performing the function of gigabit fiber. So we're moving the microwave to the next layer of the network, which is the distribution plant, right? So today in a cable network, we have hybrid fiber coax. So uh, when you get past the fiber, you run coax down the street, you run a drop line that's a physical drop line to a house. And if you know anything about it, that's the highest maintenance kind of network, big OPEX kind of network to run. And, you know, AT&T abandoned Uverse, which is their DSL-based broadband network, pretty much capped its growth, said we were done, we're done you know, uh, uh, improving copper. And same with Fios, by the way. Yeah. Fios well, Fios is, is capped. Yeah. Fios is capped. Although I'm a Fios subscriber, and I haven't seen my bill going down, by the way. Yeah. So I'd love to see that happen. Um, <laughs> But going back to the fixed wireless, both Verizon and AT&T's first initiatives on 5G will be to provide a wireless Fios or a wireless U-verse in which they'll take the millimeter wave, drive the microwave down the distribution plant, and then give you a wireless drop line so that you don't have to build a physical drop line. And in fact, your ability to change service providers will be very quick and easy. Um, and you could argue it could even be a you know, common network, but nobody's going to allow common network anymore. So, you know, it's why AT&T's developed air gig and, you know, new technologies. But it'll be way farther in the future that we'll see 5G mobile. We have, um, uh, I have a variety of other questions for our panel, among them are related to this, the transition over to voice, voice uh, navigation for devices, Expecting that ramp up your uh, Alexa, Siri, Cortana interface is growing pattern to maybe 30% of your interaction with systems will be uh, by other than uh, our historic patterns of navigation or about the, uh, the point that was raised about, about augmented reality, virtual reality and virtual worlds that will be a, a, a new pattern of usage growing ever more in the population. But just that, that we have a few minutes left in time, I'd like to uh, open it to the audience and uh, <clears throat> see if you have any questions for the panel. And I'm not sure I heard this correctly, but I, I guess the question, should network operators own content? Well, that was a part yeah, of it. A part of it, yeah. Is, that, is that a good strategy? The mi minority here, but I would Basically, I, I just think being a dumb pipe is where the highest return on investor capital comes. The towers are just a dumb pipe in the air. Their returns on investor capital are off the charts. And I can point to you like 50 examples. I kind of believe that OTT is a, a global business. Netflix is global, Google's go global, Facebook is global. The carriers are regional. I think they can make some money at it and be okay at it, but I don't think it's the highest and best use of, of their capital or their strategy, but I understand why they're doing it. It's uh, taking your question and twisting it a little bit. This is why would AT&T, why would Time Warner sell uh, their current business? One, the evaluation was very good for them, but, but also the amount of capital required to create new content is starting to equate to very similar to the amount of capital that AT&T has been putting in to their networks. So how do you manage large chunks of capital and invest that capital? It's a completely different area, obviously, than, than investing in wireless networks and building networks. But the amount of capital that's starting to exponentially increase to create new shows, because not all the shows will be hits. And there will be a lot of duds there. So you need somebody with a deep enough pockets to be able to, um, to keep an enabling producing new shows, new movies, new TV shows. And that, that amount of investment requ required a, a different partner. It required AT&T or required somebody long term to do that. And that's why, frankly, Comcast and, uh, and NBCU, in that sense, that you needed a partner to actually help with, the, frankly, be the, the, the money behind the, 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 the creation of the content. Miguel, that's 
Miguel, it, to me, that sounds like uh, uh, it's focusing on a, a, a particular class of content grow, that's growing. And yeah, it's for Game of Thrones, and but there's one heck of an ocean of content being created a lot cheaper that's going to find an outlet as well in the mix uh, on it as well. So I, I don't think one pattern of explanation, it's like I hear with pharma all the time, as if uh, one, one drug costs billions of dollars to make when we have evidence of so many of others that are uh, pillage and plundering the market. But my point is, you know, in, in any one house, there are typically 10 or 12, 15 devices that are creating traffic that are driving b bandwidth <laughs> utilization. So you're right, any one individual may not be the bottleneck, although I think they will, because like TVs, our mobile phones are on all the time, 24 hours a day, and in fact, our applications are generating more traffic which we don't even know about, just by hanging out there, by being on. So you're, you're right, but I agree that 5G in part is to take bands that no one could have imagined using and bringing them into the mobile domain, just stockpile them, just to make them available for the future, whether they actually use them in the near term or not. And by the way, when they bring them in, they're going to need to be shared with the incumbent users. They're not going to be owned and uh, controlled by the, the operators themselves. They're going to be shared spectrum bands. Well, and, but what Verizon wants is to get a gigabit to your house yeah. and kick out the cable company. And now they sell a quad play to you. And they're, I don't think any of us are going to need gigabits unless we're starting to do virtual reality. But that'll come you know, at okay. some point. Yeah. Also, the, the growth of video, the growth of the applications that, that we have today, 5G need, need, needs to come to alleviate all that. I think first you will see, like I said before, a combination of many things, but eventually that is coming. Yeah. <coughs> you're talking about overall capacity rather than specific. Yeah, you, you always need more capacity, and, and, and people find a way to use the capacity. And that, that's always been the case, and that will continue to be the case. There will be use cases that we haven't dreamed of yet that would leverage greater capacity. It, virtual reality, the amount of, amount of bandwidth that it requires, if that takes off in a big way, specific let's use get, cases, we'll do it. Let's get one more question, please. I, I just came from an IoT security conference where blockchain has become the, the new vogue for how we're going to solve uh, IoT security. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical. Uh, I think it's an important ingredient. I think it would be a very important tool. Uh, but I think we got to attack security at every layer. It's a multi-layer problem. And if we just focus on isolating one attribute of security that blockchain addresses, uh, we'll probably leave tons of vulnerabilities elsewhere that we don't even know exist. So I, I, I think it's, it's too simple, too, na too narrow a solution right now. But I think it's going to be part of the mix, no doubt. And you know, fortunately, you know, the, the drug dealers will also have to use it as well. <laughs> the, uh, that spectrum of extra, gover uh, extra sovereign and extra gover uh, regulatory issues come into play here too that we haven't even dis decided how that will impact it. Correct. I think uh, I'd like to thank our panel.